Here's how it goes. Laura G. Okay, full screen, record reactions. You don't want to leave. Start video. Oh, there you are. See? Yes. Yeah. Do you see mm -hmm. it right here? Okay. Where's you? I'm here. And she's over there. Max is right there. See, oh, my God. See, you can get, you can get cozier. Get a little closer, maybe. Get closer. Yep. Hello, everyone. Greetings, wherever you are, and welcome to the first ever Belknap Family Organization uh, virtual reunion. My name is Kirk Belknap, and I am the currently serving president of the Belknap Family Organization. Um, I am, uh, we are very, very excited to, to have you with us today. And, and um, uh, yes, just, just, just lovely. So like, as of our, as of right now, we have with us, um, as of right now, we have with us, let's see. I saw the, the count, and now I've lost the count. Oh, 69. Terrific. Wherever you might be, very excited to have you with us. I am... Uh, I am just having the, the usual uh, Zoom juggling act here and hopefully we're good to go and let's see how this how this goes okay I'm going, to, I'm going to start over for the broadcast uh, so we can just have a nice, uh, smooth broadcast uh, recording. So, pardon, pardon, the, uh, pardon the stumble. Greetings wherever you are, and welcome to the first ever Belmont Family Organization. Let me see, we need to meet. Back there. Can you hear me? Give me a give me a thumbs up here. We're good to go. All right. Greetings wherever you are, and welcome to the first ever Belknap Family Organization virtual reunion. My name is Kirk Belknap, and I am the current ser currently serving president of the Belknap Family Organization. Uh, pioneers Gilbert Belknap, Adeline Mc, Adeline Knight, and um, uh, oh brother, uh, I can see that I've I need to go into manual. Oh goodness gracious! So sorry, folks. Um, gotta, gotta fix something here. Okay, manually. Well, if you're going to do something technologically for a first, yeah, for a first group, that's that's going to be what you're going to get, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I think we can do it. <laughs> okay, so we can. Uh, yes. So the Belknap Family Organization is one of the oldest and largest nonprofit ancestral organizations in the United States. Its person, purpose is to preserve, perpetuate, and promote family solidarity among all descendants of our shared ancestors. 
Membership is automatic for all descendants of Gilbert, Adeline, and Henrietta, who now number well over 11,500 and are found in most states and several countries across uh, the US. To be included in our member database, please contact an officer or family representative. Members are encouraged to share life stories, genealogical information on their immediate families, family photographs, and any other items of historical interest to the Belknap Family Organization for preservation and dissemination on our website at wp.belknapfamily.org. We will begin with a prayer by Pat Johnson, a descendant of Gilbert Belknap and Adeline Knight through their son Joseph, who has served wonderfully for many years as our treasurer, but will uh, we'll be stepping down this year to let others take a turn. Pat, can you go ahead and just unmute yourself? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are very grateful for the technology to allow us to join across the miles in this historic meeting. We're grateful for our shared Belknap heritage. We ask a blessing on our presenters for this meeting, for the participants. We ask for a blessing on all of us during this difficult time of unrest and pandemic. Please watch over us and bless us. We might enjoy our family history and our research and the information that we're to receive this day and, and join together as a family. These things we say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you very much, Pat. We are delighted to welcome all of you who are now with us live, as well as you who will watch the recording at a later date. We are pleased to announce that a new version of our website is now live. We encourage you to visit it often. You'll also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Please take a moment to like us on Facebook and encourage your family members to do so. We thank Don Hammond for the 2020 issue of The Crier, which is hot off the press and available on our website. <clears throat> We encourage you, everyone who is able to make a financial contribution, however modest, but we understand that some are not in a, posi a position to do so currently. We wish you and everyone struggling with employment or health or other challenges all the best. As provided by our Belknap Family Organization, uh, officers will remain the same for another two years with the exception of the treasurer as mentioned. That means that I will continue as president, uh, Julie James Moselle as first vice president, Brent J. Belknap as second vice president, and Matthew D. Pur uh, <clears throat> Purcell as secretary. We now uh, propose Steve G. Belknap, who is a CPA, as the new treasurer. If you are in favor, please send a yes or a thumbs up, thumbs up in the chat box. <clears throat> I'm assuming <clears throat> that that went well. Um, we will assume that. And we, we thank all of the officers for their willingness to serve. We're particularly, particularly grateful um, for, well, for everyone, but especially for our family organization, our family representatives um, who keep this organization uh, really going. And uh, we encourage you to contact your family representative. You can find them on the website. We cannot, um, <clears throat> we cannot reasonably replicate our traditional roll call by family branch and generations activity online uh, at this do, do this online at the reunion, this reunion, but we invite each of you to report on yourself and those watching with you by, by email. Here's the, the email. Um, and by the way, you can find this, the uh, uh, current statistical data uh, by, by branch and generation on the, uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the website under the tab Interesting Info uh, Family Statistics. And uh, so you could also do, you can also report if you're, uh, if you, if, if you would prefer not to use uh, email for your, for your reporting, you could also do this by registering under the Get Involved tab, then sign up, register tab. If possible, in your email or, on, or there, please indicate your family branch 
and include a contact phone number. And please let us know if we may include you in our family database and email you future reunion announcements. We take your privacy very seriously and want you to know that no personal data is stored on the website. To encourage others not now with us to watch the reunion sooner than later, we are going to have a little friendly competition between the branches of the family. Encourage your, <clears throat> please encourage your immediate and extended family uh, relations to watch and report in the next 30 days. We'll, we'll level the playing field by estimating the size of each branch of the family and then measuring percent response from each branch. We will email the results to respondents with an update on uh, family demogra demographics. I've uh, finally <clears throat> let me say that we welcome volunteers of all ages and skills. We will uh, now watch a short video, part two, of the uh, life of Gilbert Belknap, prepared by Ashley Belknap, who is a descendant of Gilbert Belknap and Henry Netta McBride through their son, Oliver. We deeply appreciate her dedicated efforts and look forward to similar presentations on Adeline, Adeline Knight and Henrietta McBride in coming reunions. Next year, we celebrate the 200th birthday of both Gilbert and Henrietta, and we welcome suggestions as to how to do so and encourage volunteers with various skills, technical or other, those young and young at heart, to volunteer to help with various aspects of the Belknap family or orientation organization. We'll now hear a word of introduction from Ashley Belknap about the video. And Ashley, you're welcome to go um, uh, on uh, live if you would like. Um, okay, I'm, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well today, uh, like Kirk said, we're gonna see part two of the three-part series of Gilbert. 176 years ago today, Gilbert actually arrived in Nauvoo. He was penniless, he was a convert of two years, but he was ready to serve the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Prophet Joseph. Uh, the video really focuses on 1843 to 1846, so really focusing on his conversion years. So please enjoy this story, and I'm grateful to the whole Belknap organization. Uh, it was such a wonderful experience to spend uh, quite a few hours engaged in these sources and this work. So enjoy. Thank you, Ashley. Can I can I have a question? I'm new at this. I apologize. Can sure. uh, when the three parts are completed, can we maybe buy the DVD that has the whole story because it's very well done and very interesting. I would love to add to my library. As far as sharing it, uh, it will be on the website, so you can you can access it by YouTube or or the link, and you'll find the 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 link on the on the website. Um, so that's probably as easy as anything uh, I hope would. If not, you could send us a message about, and we could work on on seeing it, finding out if we can figure out another way to share it with you. Okay, okay. So let's go ahead to our video. <clears throat> An orphan by age 11, Gilbert Belknap quickly learned the importance of resilience and fortitude, two qualities that would serve him well a decade later when he would commit himself to the gospel of Jesus Christ. A few years after his parents' death, Gilbert served as first sergeant in the American Light Horse Rangers from 1837 to 1839. After surviving his time in battle and as a prisoner of war, Gilbert made his way south and ended up in Ohio in 1840. He started working for Abner Cleveland in the town of New Bedford. After listening to a long conversation between Mr. Cleveland and another about the town of Kirtland and the beauty and construction of the Mormon temple, it prompted my curiosity and of a roving disposition, I longed to form an acquaintance with that people and to behold their temple of worship. 
The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had established itself in Kirtland in 1831 and constructed a beautiful temple which had attracted curious people from many miles around. Intrigued, Gilbert struck out for Kirtland. Impressed by the temple, he ended up staying in Kirtland and began working on the Crary Farm. I formed an acquaintance with several families called Mormons and by close observation satisfied myself that they lived their religion better and enjoyed more of the Spirit of God than any people that I had ever been acquainted with. Thereby, I strove to make myself familiar with their principles of religion and after a vigilant investigation of nearly two years, I satisfied myself with regard of the truth of Mormonism and determined at some future time to obey its principles. With Gilbert feeling that there was plenty of time yet to fully commit to the doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he left Kirtland on September 10th, 1841 to rendezvous with his older brother, John. They met in Erie, Pennsylvania at the home of their grandfather, Jesse Belknap, whom Gilbert had never met before. Gilbert stayed in the Northeast for about two weeks, becoming acquainted with some of his father's relatives. Although not yet baptized, Gilbert discussed with them at great lengths the principles of Mormonism. After some time with his family, he returned to Kirtland and continued laboring for Mr. Crary. In the winter of 1841, Gilbert had a serious accident that fractured his skull in three places and dislocated his right shoulder and left ankle. He was confined to his bed from December 23rd, 1841 until April 13th, 1842, during which time he was cared for by a neighboring Mormon family. Most of the time I suffered very acute pains. Every mark of kindness within the power of mortals was freely extended to me. One family of Mormons named Dixon to this day have my good feelings for their kindness in times of distress. On April 12th, 1842, Gilbert covenanted before God and a witness named Jeremiah Knight that if he would raise him up from his bed, he would follow the restored gospel. Within the space of eight hours, Gilbert was miraculously healed. He continued working on the prairie farm, but continued to put off his baptism for another season. On the 4th of July, 1842, Gilbert encountered the son of an old enemy from his youth while in the home of a friend in nearby Painesville. The two men went outside where a brawl quickly ensued between them. As a result of this violence, both men were severely injured. But now Gilbert's heart was finally softened and he longed for a life of peace and solitude. Waiting for the bruises and injuries to heal so he could enter into baptism without any marks of violence, Gilbert was baptized in September 1842. Sunday, September 11th, 1842, was the most important day in my life, for in the presence of a vast multitude of saints, I yielded my obedience to the gospel which long before I had been sensible it was my duty to do. At that time, with a determined purpose, I strove to keep the commandments of God. Accordingly, I deprived myself of many amusements, in which before this time I had been an extravagant participant. With full purpose of heart, I devoted my time and talents to the service of God. Less than one month after his baptism, Gilbert was called to serve a mission for the LDS Church to New York State. On December 17, 1842, Gilbert left for his first mission. He assisted in raising up branches of the church in upstate New York, baptizing over 70 people. Gilbert suffered many deprivations associated with missionary service without purse or scrip. At the end of his mission, Gilbert walked the entire distance from New York to Kirtland in midsummer 1843, returning home due to poor health. He later started to make his way to Nauvoo, Illinois. We embarked on the steamboat Lehigh for St. Louis, Missouri. I had not long been on board before I learned that there were others of the same faith as myself, bound also for Nauvoo. 
only they would be compelled to stop in Cincinnati for lack of funds. I proposed to pay for their passage as I had circumstances that would permit. He finally arrived in Nauvoo on the evening of June 1st, 1844. He arrived without a single coin in his pocket and that first night he slept in the open air on a wooden slab. The next day he viewed the rising foundations of the temple and other places within Nauvoo. Gilbert then met the prophet Joseph Smith for the first time on June 3rd, 1844. I was introduced to the prophet. While I was standing before his penetrating gaze, he seemed to read the very recesses of my heart. I gazed with wonder at his person and listened with delight to the sound of his voice. My very destiny seemed to be interwoven with his. At that time and afterward, in public and in private, I paid attention. I loved his company. He, by the inspiration of God, restored the gospel to the earth. And at the same time, he endured the most unparalleled persecution of any man. It was during this immense persecution of the Prophet Joseph and the saints in Nauvoo that Gilbert took up the cause of protecting the Prophet. Before leaving for a special assignment, Gilbert was promised by Joseph Smith that not one hair of his head would fall to the ground. While in Hancock County, Illinois, Gilbert was attacked by a Missourian who thrust a hunting knife at his bowels. The knife penetrated all of Gilbert's layers of clothing but did not injure him. The Missourian miraculously fell unconscious. Persecution continued heavily for the next few weeks. On June 26, 1844, approximately 10 men, including Gilbert, stayed in the downstairs room of the Carthage jail all night, where they remained until the next day while Joseph Smith and others were upstairs. At two o'clock in the afternoon of June 27th, Joseph Smith came to the upstairs window of the Carthage jail and admonished Gilbert and the other guards to return home for the sake of their own lives. He followed the prophet's request and left the jail. Later that evening, Gilbert and Porter Rockwell headed back to Carthage where they learned of the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram Smith. The next day, Gilbert witnessed the funeral procession bearing the bodies of Joseph and Hiram back to Nauvoo. In the afternoon of June 28th, the mournful procession arrived bearing the mangled bodies of the prophet and his brother. There assembled thousands of saints gazed in mournful silence on the faces of the dead. While penning these few lines, tears of sorrow still moisten my cheek. Gilbert's experiences of being introduced to the church, his conversion, his mission, and the tragic death of the prophet he loved prepared him for the arduous journey to the West and years of service to his family, community, and his God. Just before his death, he left this charge to his posterity. May the influence that I have and the priesthood that I bear be used to induce my posterity to seek first the kingdom of God and its future greatness on the earth. Thank you, Ashley. We are deeply, deeply grateful to you for this, um, this tremendous, <coughs> tremendous contribution. <clears throat> I, um, let's see. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Ugo Perego from Rome. Ugo was my student in Jerusalem years ago and is a dear friend. He is the director of the Rome Italy Institute of Religion of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
and a visiting scientist at the University of Perugia in Italy. He holds a PhD in genetics and biomolecular science. He is an expert on DNA topics relating to population migrations, ancestry, forensics, and history. We thank him for joining us and turn the time over to him. Please send questions you have for him to us in the chat box. Okay, I guess it's my time now. It's your time. All right, I am pleased to be here and uh, we're gonna talk about DNA today and in my genetics, you also get a thick Italian accent. So hopefully you will uh, uh, be able to understand what I'm gonna share with you. I'm gonna use some slide and uh, that should make things a little easier. So I trust you can see the slides I'm sharing with you right now. Kirk, can you give me a thumbs up? Yes. You do it. Can you hear me okay too? Yes. All right. I'm actually not in Rome right now. Uh, a friend of mine has invited me to stay with, uh, with him and uh, invited my family. So I'm actually in Sicily, uh, down south in a beautiful country, uh, best food in the world. So if you ever had a chance to come to Sicily uh, or to Italy, Sicily is the place you want to go uh, for sure. So today I'm going to share some information about how DNA works in uh, reconstructing family history information. Now I've been given just a few minutes to share with you what I usually share in a course that I teach at Soleil Community College that lasts a full semester, about 14 weeks. And that course is actually called an introduction to DNA and family history, which means that uh, uh, there is a lot more that could be uh, taught and shared and learned from the topic of using DNA for uh, uh, genealogical purposes. So wish me luck and I wish you luck <laughs> to, uh, to follow me. So, Buckle up and let's see um, what we can get out of this, uh, um, this little time together. Uh, for those of you that uh, are already familiar with the topic or would like, would like to uh, expand or uh, become more familiar, or even for those of you that have never really looked into it, I would like to uh, suggest a wonderful, easy to read book by a good friend of mine, Blaine Bettinger, and uh, there is this book out there called The Guide to DNA Testing Gen Genealogy. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to give you a taste of it, but if you like to expand on this knowledge, this book could be a great place to start uh, for all of you. Now the basics of genetic genealogy or DNA genealogy uh, are fairly simple. Um, everyone has DNA, we carry that in our cells, and uh, that DNA does not come from nothing. The genetic material that we carry in our cells is the direct gift or inheritance from our parents, uh, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents back several generations. It is not created for the vast majority, uh, it's not created out of nothing, but is uh, uh, the recombination or the shuffling and the mixing of the DNA of people that came directly before us. And uh, this creates a, a wonderful link, a biological link, a welding link, if you want to use the, the words found in Doctrine and Covenants, that ties one generation to the next one. Um, it also ties people uh, along lateral lines, so not only direct ancestral line, as uh, uncles and cousins will also share DNA with us as we go back in time, they will share gen um, ancestors with us as well. The great things about DNA, uh, at least one of the, the strengths of it, is that uh, you can uh, measure this DNA just like you would measure uh, quantities or uh, you know, volume or distances. Uh, there are ways to measure the amount of DNA two individuals share. And based on the quantity of DNA two individuals share, we can determine or guess 
the level of biological relationship that they also show. Now, as you can see, this is a great tool for individuals that are perhaps are looking um, for, uh, you know, their, their biological parents. So looking, you know, we're talking about adoptees, uh, individuals that have very shallow genealogies, you know, maybe they know who the mother is or the, 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 the grandparent, one set of grandparents, but they don't know the other one. So this, this would, uh, could give an opportunity uh, to these individuals to extend or, or, or find a connection that they did not previously have. Now, this is not just something for people that have shallow genealogies or they are adopted. Uh, the fact that we all share DNA can help us overlap the genetic information with the genealogical information and thus verify or expand uh, correct genealogical information that we might already have. Um, there are basically four types of uh, DNA used for genetic genealogy. We are going to briefly introduce you to three of them. The fourth one is not quite practical and not very used, um, but it's available and for certain specific cases can come handy as well. And that these four types of DNA are the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, and the autosomal DNA. We're gonna look at this information again as we go through this presentation. Again, I'd like for you to understand that DNA does not replace genealogy. Uh, someone just not give uh, their DNA, their saliva sample to a company, and in return they get a full pedigree chart. However, uh, we're kind of moving into that direction. I'm going to show you toward the end of this presentation using uh, your president, Kurt Belknap, as an example, how certain tools have been developed where actually a simple DNA test can get you quite on your way with your genealogy if you are at the beginning of your genealogical research. There are several companies that provide DNA testing nowadays. Uh, we don't have time to talk about each one of them. Uh, the major things to look for when you uh, have a DNA test done um, are, is uh, the size of their database. These companies do not share the DNA with each other. So if I'm tested with one company, I'm not able to access the database of another company. Uh, just in the same way that if you have your family history information in a, uh, family search, you will not be able to look at it into an ancestry or my heritage unless you create multiple accounts and you link them together. Now there are ways to do the same with the, with DNA, link them. But um, when you are tested with one company, usually the first things you can do is just look for uh, matches within their customer-based database. So whatever. Um, Whoever has been tested within a company, those are the people you can compare your DNA with. Uh, privacy uh, is also ensured, just like it would be with a, a regular genealogical databases, uh, that, uh, a genealogical database or service like FamilySearch. Um, however, they are not 100% bulletproof. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with anything that is done online, there are always uh, the, there is always the risk to have some sort of security breach or hacking or cloning. You know, you can see that done with uh, other socials like Facebook, for example, or Instagram. Uh, so changing your password and checking for uh, messages from the company regularly, that prevents from uh, uh, this type of uh, things to happen and, and maintain your privacy. But overall, they're very secure. I've been having my DNA tested with all these companies for nearly two decades now, and uh, I never had so far knock on wood any problem with uh, with my DNA. Now this is where the uh, things start becoming a little more clear. I hope for you um, is uh, is a traditional pedigree chart. You can be the girl at the bottom, all in red, or the male, half blue and half red. Uh, every one of us had two parents, four grandparents, eight great grandparents, and so on and so forth. Uh, the number of ancestors double each generation. But as we place ourselves on this tree, there are specific uh, inheritance patterns, specific parts of our DNA that come through our pedigree chart. And I mentioned to you earlier 
that we're talking about three major components which uh, we're going to focus on today and uh, one of them is the male inherited Y chromosome is male specific only males have it so here if this would be me uh, you know as, as a man in this pedigree then I would have the same Y chromosome information as I received it from my father to receive it from his father and so on along an unbroken paternal line. A woman does not have her father Y chromosome, which is a good thing as a, uh, we like for half of the population world population not to have the Y chromosome. Um, however, if she's interested in tracing her paternal line, she can have a male relative sharing that paternal line or her maiden name be tested in her stead. So that would be either her father or her brother or a nephew uh, from her father's side. So those will be some individual. Another component of the DNA comes through the unbroken maternal line. It's called mitochondrial DNA. Uh, it follows uh, the umbilical cord is uh, inherited from mothers to children. That means that also men receive it but men are not capable biologically to pass that genetic component through their children. So I have five children, but all of them, or five of them, would have my wife mitochondrial DNA. I am the last one uh, in my line that would have the mitochondrial DNA, as none of my posterity will get it from me. So I inherited from my mom, but it will not go past. My, I have a sister so she could technically pass it on but she only had boys so i'm afraid that for my immediate family we're coming to an end when it comes to passing this specific genetic component to future generation that's one of the important things also as i might want to open a parenthesis about it uh, in having individual tested or having your own dna tester because you never know two or three generations from now if those individuals carrying specific components of your family history DNA will be around, and you may need that information um, later on. I have an example that I can share with you about this. The last component is the one that uh, is called autosomal DNA, is the one here on the top. That is the DNA that we receive from all of our ancestors. Um, is the DNA for those of you that are familiar with the human genome that is divided in 23 chromosomes and the chromosome 1 to 22 is considered autosomal DNA. The 23rd pair is the sex chromosome where the Y chromosome in the males would be one of those chromosomes. So autosomal DNA is the majority of our DNA. The, uh, the difference, although we, we receive it from all of our ancestors, as you can see from these percentages, um, it becomes, uh, it, it, you lose half of it at every generation. So after a certain number of generations, five or six uh, generations, autosomal DNA becomes a little more difficult to use to trace family history. On the other hand, Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA, although they represent only a single line, one ancestor, in our direct lines, uh, it goes on uh, many more generations in the past. Um, I'm going to give you an example about each of these methods and, uh, and then conclude with something that has to, you know, uh, about the DNA of uh, uh, Kirk Bellenlamp as an example of uh, what you're going to have from DNA testing. So I'm going to start with the Y chromosome, which is the one that you see on the left side of your pedigree, of this pedigree that you have in front of you. So the Y chromosome, uh, and don't worry too much about all the information that is on this slide, but the, the, the two most important pieces of information that you need to know about the Y chromosome is number one, it comes from a direct father to son line that would be the surname line or the Belknap line in your, in your case, if you're interested in, in uh, the individual Gilbert Belknap that we just watched a, a video about it, that everyone sharing the Belknap surname, every male sharing the Belknap surname in your family should also share Gilbert Belknap 
Y chromosome profile, which is the one that you see at the very bottom of this slide. Um, this, we call it in a, in a scientific jargon, we call it a haplotype, uh, but it would be just fine to call it, you know, a Y chromosome profile or fingerprint or signature. You know, it's a series of numbers or values that would be unique to a specific paternal line. So two individuals sharing uh, in the fairly recent past, and we're talking about even 10, 15, 20 generation as a recent past, uh, sharing a common direct paternal ancestor, father to son, and perhaps sharing us the same or similar surname, they could also check if they share the same or, or almost all of them of these values, if they would be the same or very similar, and that would prove that they share a common paternal ancestor. As in the example I'm about to give you, uh, we have uh, two individuals, uh, H2 and H3, who are the grandsons of an individual named Carol Haponen. This is a, a true case I work with uh, this family a number of years ago from Finland. And uh, as you can see, there is a dotted line above Carol Haponen, which means that H2 and H3 knew their paternal line only back to this individual, Carol. But he was an illegitimate child. Uh, he was a, not, nothing was known about his father. And so H2 and H3 and, uh, were tested for their Y chromosome. And uh, eventually, through a number of investigation, genealogical investigation, there was the suspect, uh, there was the, the possibility that uh, H2 and H3 could share a paternal line with individual uh, labeled here as H1, who is a descendant from a family whose last name is Hellman which sounds a little bit like Hillman in our Book of Mormon. And um, Hellman, different surname, different story, but what we had is a paternal direct descendant that was willing to share his Y chromosome. So what I had now was a test, a DNA test for H1, H2, and H3 to see if these three lines were indeed um, the, the, the share the same paternal line all of them and this is the uh, the chart and again it's on lots of values a lot of numbers this is something that uh, um, a company will do for you you don't have to, to look at each number manually by yourself you know i'm just producing this chart for you to see the similarities at each of the locations that were tested so if you look at the first line uh, the one that labeled dys19 all three individuals have the same uh, the same value, which in turn means that they receive that value from the common ancestor, and there is no need to dig up anyone and get anyone's DNA that has passed away, as long as we have these uh, living descendants and their genealogies that we can assemble and put together and then test to see if they're accurate with their DNA. So in this case, the values that this individual, these three individuals share is able, with, and together with the, um, the circumstantial, historical, and genealogical evidence, we're able to uh, confirm that all three of them are descended from the same paternal line, although at the beginning that information was not known due again to this illegitimacy. Now, an example on the mitochondrial DNA, again, uh, this is the DNA that is inherited directly from the maternal line. The difficulty is uh, with this case, with this line, is that at each generation, a woman changes her surname as she's married. And uh, therefore, you cannot use mitochondrial DNA as a way to compare uh, the DNA of two individuals sharing the same last name as you can do with the Y chromosome. So it takes a little bit more investigation to do that, um, to use that tool in genealogy. Uh, again, this is what it will look like if you have it uh, done. You can, uh, every time you have your DNA test with a company, they actually allow you to download 
the uh, raw data, so the actual set of values, but as you can see, it is not something that anybody will will look at and play with it manually. It's not like a, you know a crossword puzzle. You know, um, most of this work is done behind the scenes, and what you receive from the company is a number of individuals that share the mitochondria or the Y chromosome or the autosomal DNA with you without having to deal directly with those uh, uh, with these values that could be quite confusing and overwhelming if you're not familiar with them. What I want you to show is that once your mitochondrial DNA is tested, this is what it will look like um, as it is produced in a lab. And uh, different segments of these uh, values have different meaning and can be used in a different way. Uh, you might have been familiar um, a few years ago with the case of King Richard III, um, the, the body of this king, um, people did not know where he was buried and uh, eventually has a, a parking lot was uh, redone and, uh, and uh, they did some excavation in this area. They discovered the skeleton and the morphological, the anatomy of the skeleton showed signs that uh, uh, historically match the, the body of King Richard III, the wounds from his death, as they were recorded, and other physiological, um, other physical characteristics. Um, this is a, an individual, Richard III, that lived over 500 years ago. And uh, there are individuals today that are the share, they're not direct descendants from him because he being a male could not pass the mitochondrial DNA, but he had a sister. And there are direct mother to children, mother to daughter lines surviving to this day. So we have individuals alive today. One of them is the guy that has been swabbed in this picture. Um, Michael is his name. Michael Ibsen is one of those two guys uh, highlighted in red in the, in the pedigree chart. And uh, he is uh, third, uh, what is that? nearly 16 generations removed from King Richard. And uh, another individual was uh, also identified, Wendy. And so they, these people are separated by, uh, you can see 13 generation, 15 generation to the most common maternal ancestors, and then a few more back to King Richard. All of them sharing the same mitochondrial DNA sequence which uh, has been uh, labeled J1C2C, which is not something you need to remember. But what we have here is uh, a pedigree information that was available historically, a skeleton that was uh, identified and, and uh, found in a parking lot, and together with the historical and the anatomical information, now DNA is also providing an additional evidence that uh, this individual um, could have been uh, very likely Richard III and, and be provided a proper burial um, to, 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 to this day. Now, I work on a case that uh, some of you may be familiar with, uh, which has to do with the Mountain Meadow Massacre, uh, perhaps the darkest hour in uh, uh, Mormon history. Uh, September 11, 1857 is the date where the massacre took place down south in Utah in an area called Mountain Meadows um, near St. George and Cedar City. And um, there have been many books written uh, on this subject. If you're interested to study more about this event, uh, um, there is a gospel essay topics written on LDS.org. Um, or Church of Jesus Christ or org as it is called today or also there is a, there is a wonderful book by Richard Thurley uh, and other two historians that uh, that you can read but um, the case study here that the reason why I was approached by a church historian was that uh, in the massacre uh, it appeared that uh, a number of children were spared and uh, given uh, for adoption to local families Eventually, seven. Oh, uh, uh. Yeah, she got invited to a tea party. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
so 17, 17 children were eventually identified uh, but they thought that there was an 18 child that uh, was missing this 18 child eventually was identified as a priscilla who was uh, um, the child associated with philip clean smith who was a bishop involved with the mountain meadow so the question was is priscilla clean smith the 18 child uh, that was part of this uh, of this group of people going from uh, Arkansas to California, or was uh, Priscilla the daughter, the biological daughter of Philip Klinsmith? So this is uh, another three that has been reconstructed with Priscilla uh, being uh, uh, part of one of the lines uh, and a direct maternal descendant. So we're talking about mother to daughter all the way to M1. So we have uh, what it is, a granddaughter of Priscilla uh, on the left part of this pedigree. Then uh, there was a sister uh, of Priscilla, or in other words, uh, another child of another girl from Philip Smith and his wife, Betsy Cato. She was born in 1859, so two years after the massacre. So no reason to link this uh, second child to the caravan. And we had a great-grandchild tested. Uh, label M2, and then for to further uh, verify this situation, um, another uh, direct descendant of uh, uh, the sister of Betsy Cato was tested. So we have M1, M2, and M3, all direct female ancestors, all possible case studies for a uh, mitochondrial DNA test. So what we have is a chart here with the same values. This is done manually by myself, and uh, you can see. M1 and M2 and M3 all sharing the same mitochondrial line, which, in other words, would uh, place Priscilla Klinsmith as a biological child of Bishop Klinsmith and not as one of the child surviving the massacre and uh, being given for adoption. Um, later on, historical accounts that were closer in time to the massacre has demonstrated that perhaps the children were 17 and not 18, as other sources have uh, uh, recorded. So what does, it, what does this uh, mean then uh, from a, a family history point of view? So this is my tree, this is right in the middle. I carry the Y chromosome of my paternal line and I carry the mitochondrial DNA for my maternal line. So I'm able to use this information to study and extend these two lines. However, as I go around and ask DNA samples to other members of my family, not sharing Y chromosome or mitochondrial DNA with me, I'm able to fill other lines in my tree. For example, uh, I went to my maternal uncle, that would be my mother's brother, and asked for his Y chromosome, a DNA sample to test his Y chromosome, which I was then able to trace my maternal grandfather Y chromosome line thanks to another member of my family. So it is not my DNA sample, it's somebody else's DNA sample, but the tree is mine. So I can use that information to fill another line, which will be this, the paternal line of my mother. I did the same thing by having the DNA of my grandfather and of my father, and then uh, being able to both to first confirm and verify my my paternal line, but also to add mitochondrial DNA for their respective line, which will not be something that I would have. So you see, although you do not carry all the DNA for all your family members, you can ask other family members to be tested and borrow that information to place on your own tree. So the tree is the same, it's just you don't have all the DNA that you um, to represent all of your ancestors. So the last example, and then I'm going to close, uh, is uh, uh, the, of the autosomal DNA. Uh, autosomal DNA has the advantage to represent multiple lines of our family tree, but has the disadvantage of uh, uh, being uh, uh, losing half of it at each generation, so becoming quite diluted after five or six generations. And um, this is a simplified chart. You find many of these on the internet where you start with yourself being the self. And then you can see 
in within your family, both the direct line or the lateral lines, uh, how much of your autosomal DNA you would share with these people. You can see how quickly that amount become uh, a small amount. So I have, you know, 50% with my brother and sister, 50% with, with my parents, 50% with my children. But then if I just go to, over to my first cousin, okay, my first cousin, it already drops to 12.5%. Second cousin, 3.1%. Third cousin, 0 0.7, 8, almost 0.8%. And um, seems like these are very small number, almost uh, insignificant. But remember, we're starting with a lot of DNA. We're starting with over 3 billion pieces of DNA. So even 0.8% of 3 billion is a lot of DNA. Now, not all 3 billion pieces are tested, of course. Um, they, they test a, a significant amount of, those, uh, uh, of the autosomal DNA. But what I want to say is that even a small percentage can produce quite important information in your family tree uh, within, again, five or six generations. Um, now, all autosomal DNA is inherited in equal amounts. I have 50% of my mom and 50% of my dad autosomal DNA. But as we move back to my grandparents' generation, we can have quite a bit of uh, uh, discrepancies or differences between grandchildren. So this is a, an hypothetical chart. Uh, there are three cases, three pie charts for three brothers and, uh, and uh, their grandparents, you know. And so the, these are all brothers, right? The same mom and same dad. And yet one grandson might have more of his paternal grandfather, PGF, paternal grandfather, the purple uh, slice, uh, of uh, grandson two, which might have inherited less DNA, or grandson three might have even more than grandson one. That's because it's a probability. There is not a machinery in place that exactly divide the DNA in pieces and, and distribute that among descendants in the same amount. We can have technically, although it's never happened, but you can have technically as much as 50% of DNA of one of your grandparents and as little as 0%. It all due by chance, you know. So that means that as we move one generation after the other, as I look now at my great grandparents or great great grandparents, you, I can see quite a bit of a, the, uh, of a difference in how their DNA has been passed among all the descendants. So there could be individuals in your group they have more of, let's say, Gilbert DNA than others, even if you are separated uh, by the same number of generation between you and, and Gilbert, okay? So that does not make you more or less of a descendant. What I'm saying is just like eventually you are all genealogical relatives, but not necessarily all genetically or biologically relatives because the DNA just tends to disappear one generation after the other. Using these databases that are available through these companies, you know, uh, for example, you can find descendants that uh, you did not know about. Um, this man, Thomas de Berti, on the left side of this, of this slide, is an individual living in Pennsylvania that I never heard about until last year when uh, his name came up in one of these uh, genetic databases in ancestry.com. And uh, I immediately recognized the last name because that is the last name of my maternal great-grandmother, Adriana de Berti. She was born in 1903. She's been gone for many years. I, I, I have a very uh, spotted memories of her. You know, I was very young. But I remember that name being in my family tree. And uh, my grandmother is still alive, she's 94, and I asked her, have you ever heard of this Deberti line in America, in Pennsylvania? And she's like, I don't know anything about it. So there, there is a line here that uh, based on the amount of DNA and based on the information that I have and they have, um, we were able to, at the moment, propose this possible pedigree chart with a couple of unknown individuals that need to be identified 
that would be the missing link in, your, in our tree. The surname is correct. Um, the genealogical information that we have at the place of what the, where his line came from, the town, is the same as my family. The DNA shows that connection. We just need to work on finding uh, those two names on the very top of the tree. But here we made a connection, important connection that was not known before through genealogical. So in this case, what we have is DNA proposing a connection, and then the genealogy needs to be added later. Other times you have the genealogy, you use the DNA to verify that. So let's let's close with uh, some uh, some information about Ancestry.com, which is the leading company in autosomal DNA. And I'm going to use your president, uh, with his permission, a uh, few slides from uh, from uh, his account. Um, what what Ancestry.com gives you as a form of results for the product you buy from them is an ethnicity estimate provides some DNA matches, and then there is this tool called two lines. And remember at the beginning I told you, your genetic testing does not give you your genealogy, but it's a tool in addition to your genealogical research. This through lines tool is actually quickly moving in the direction where your DNA sample is actually giving you some genealogical information right at your fingertips without much work to be done on your hand. Then you have to do some work to verify that information. So I'm gonna look at each of these three very quickly. This is again all information from Kirk Belknap. Uh, I'm not gonna reveal anything about him that will put uh, him in an in in embarrassing situation uh, in the eyes of all the people in the, in, in the organization. So you can still keep him as a president for another two years. But um, so based on his ancestor, which is not only Belknap, he has a number of ancestors that are unique to him and not share with the rest of the family organization. There is a breakdown of where this DNA comes from. The way that uh, Ancestry and other company come out with this ethnicity report, which are very fancy and colorful and very attractive, um, is that they have some reference databases that have DNA from different group of people around the world and then they take the DNA of an individual, in this case, the, the DNA of Kirk Bernap, Dr. Bernap, and uh, they compare his DNA, they, they break it down with all the populations that they have as a reference, uh, in, as a standard inside their database. These, uh, these ethnicity estimates are usually the reason why people buy their DNA test uh, for family history, but should not be the main reason, the, the principal reason, because they are they have to be taken with a grain of salt human population uh, our species the 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 homo sapiens you know the the humans we are a very homogeneous population you can't uh, really divide our ethnicity using political or geographical boundaries uh, those boundaries have changed through history uh, we have uh, uh, mixed with all different populations, uh, and uh, and therefore, uh, at times, these ethnicity estimates cannot be as accurate as we wish them to be. But what uh, the, the strength, there is some strength and some accuracy to it. I'm just saying that they are not the most accurate of uh, the products you can get from a DNA test. What it comes really interesting, though are the comparison between individuals that share an amount of DNA. What Ancestry does is first show, sharing uh, people that are considered your close family. So that would be people that are, are in your immediate family, uh, siblings, for example, or children, if they were also tested, um, or first cousins. You most likely already know these individuals unless you are adopted. Uh, I have cases of individuals that are adopted that they found their half brothers and their close families without knowing anything about them. And then you can contact these individuals through um, the portal of Ancestry.com. Then you start listing everybody else uh, in an order. Is a, there is a, um, some sort of a hierarchical order from uh, people that share the most DNA with you. You can see here these amounts. 1,706 centimorgan cm. So that's a, this is individual, which probably I would guess 
is a son of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Kirk Bernard, uh, based on the amount of DNA, it is probably a daughter. And then uh, very quickly, uh, as the amount drops, you know, they are listed in that order. So the most DNA on the top, the less DNA on the bottom. And then you start having the second cousin and the third cousin and the fourth cousin. So a lot of people start popping up now that you don't know anything about. And, uh, and yet they're related to you and you can contact these individuals. And some of them have provided some genealogical information um, that you can see in this third column and click on it and look at the pedigrees. For example, here we have a second cousin, a possible second cousin named Jason Smith. It could be a nephew, it could be, you know, uh, Ancestry does not know exactly how you're related to the individual, but it knows you is related to you based on the DNA. Then you contact that person and work the, that information together. It places a blue dot on all the new matches that come up since the last time you came and check on these individuals. So these two individuals uh, have been added just recently. And uh, uh, one of them you know, has an, a, a surname that is not Bernard, which means that it could be related in many other ways through the maternal line, through the paternal line, you know, through uh, different parts of the tree. But there are others, like here we have an Alan Belna. Uh, and I don't know anything about the family history, so what I'm looking is something for me for the first time. So I don't have the background information that Kirk will have about his family. But here you have another person that shared the surname, so he knows uh, he, he's most likely related to the Belknap line, so you can click on the pedigree chart, and then uh, you can see that uh, this individual goes back to the Gilbert uh, line as well, and then you can communicate with that person if you didn't know anything about the, the individual and figure out how the two are related. So very um, satisfying, very interesting how the DNA can bring together two individuals that pre previously did not even know they existed. Um, the True Lines tool, however, is something quite amazing. Ancestry.com has billions of records on file, uh, millions and millions of family trees. So now they have millions of people that have been te tested with their DNA. So what we have here is this handsome guy, um, and I guess Robert is, is his first name. I didn't know that. Uh, Robert Kirk Bernard. And uh, he's, a, he's a descendant through this line, which is what he has placed in uh, Ancestry.com. But now Ancestry is proposing additional individuals where they, Ancestry has both the genealogy on file and individuals that have been tested. So Ancestry has actually 27 individuals that are descendants of this child of Gilbert, and 14 they are descendants of this other child, Oliver, and eight from Hiram, and nine from Augustus, so on, Augustus. And, uh, and what uh, Kirk can do is now click to evaluate and look at each of these trees and see if they actually match what he knows about his family history. So here, somebody, that has never done any genealogy can find himself or herself on a tree like this and start working and adding genealogical information the ancestry already has on file and import that in their own trees without having done much research before. And it's a great starting point where eventually can get somebody to evaluate each one of these information, of course, you know, you know, when you do genealogy in the traditional way, you just don't accept everything or you shouldn't accept everything that family search or other companies give you. You need always to evaluate and confirm that information of possibly through primary sources. But here is a great way now to move into that direction where somebody can just be placed into a tree. You have a, a page I will show from uh, uh, brand Belknap in your organization uh, on your family tree where you're going to have uh, uh, under the, the link genealogy a lot of genetic information added uh, where you can learn more about this topic, see how you can help 
uh, maybe by contributing your DNA sample to the family, being tested with one of these companies, and then talk with uh, uh, the organizer of the Belknap organization, let them know if you had your DNA test done and see how that can help uh, move forward with the objective of the organization. So I showed to you the, the uh, Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, the autosomal DNA, how they work. And uh, hopefully you have seen and, and gained a personal testimony on how DNA is an additional to the links families together. And this is all I'm going to share for today. I think I, uh, this should be enough. Kirk, what do you think? You probably have to unmute yes, yourself. Yes, yes, thank you very, very much, Ugo. What, um, we, we, we have not had any, um, any questions in the, uh, in the chat box, so uh, if if anybody would like to, I'm I'm uh, so so excited for the possibilities here. Um, uh, if if anyone, we have a few more we have a few more minutes. Uh, we said that we would end by um, end by within ninety minutes, so within by 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 eleven thirty. But we have a few more minutes, and and we've got the doctor online here. So if you've got a DNA question, you'd like to and ask. That, that let me add one thing, Kirk. Sorry to interrupt you. If if we don't, if you if we don't get to answer your question, or you come up with a question later on, you know, maybe you know tomorrow you say, oh, I wish I could have asked that question. Please send your your questions to uh, the to Kirk Bernard or the organizers, and then they will let me have uh, these questions, and I can answer them. And I think there will be a way to to make them available to you after. So it's very not good. just not just right now. Very kind of you. Very, very kind of you. Question was asked, can, can one hire a DNA specialist to help with difficult family lines? I, I, I would assume that's the case. Uh, are, you a, are you a hired gun? Uh, I am. <laughs> that's I right. <laughs> I have a website called geneticgenealogyconsultant.com, but uh, you know, eventually you can, uh, Kirk can give you my content information. You can find me also on Facebook. I'm the only Hugo Perego in the whole Facebook world. And I only take 10%, so don't worry, Father. So. <laughs> Any other questions that you would like to ask of a DNA specialist while we're, well, we've got one online right now. Yes. Ugo, what do you see as we're, as we're, as we're waiting to see if there are any other questions? What do you see as, uh, on, what are we on the brink of being able to do with DNA research? Do you see new, new opportunities what are you excited about excited about for the near future so when it uh, okay so the, the 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 most exciting thing is that dna testing is becoming more and more affordable so more dna is being tested at a cheaper price which is always great so better services at a lower cost uh, the greatest things actually comes from the fact that more and more people are being tested which means that these databases are become more useful. You know, if, if you think about, forget DNA, let's, let's focus genealogy. You get into a, a database, a genealogical database that only has, you know, one million records in it. The chances that you find anything helpful for your own family history is very slim. But if you have 10 million or 100 million records, then the chances increase that you can find something helpful. So what is what I mean is that there are more and more people nowadays that uh, are having their DNA tested. And so even someone from Italy like me is now getting some useful information. I've been having my DNA test for the last 20 years and only in the last couple of years, I'm finally finding somebody that uh, I can uh, connect to, you know? So it's a matter of patience, you know? Your DNA doesn't change, you have a test, it goes into a database, and then you receive notification as a new individual or test that might be of uh, um, some importance to you personally in your research. So that's, that's what is becoming exciting. And new tools, the true lines that I show at the end, that's something that's been available for the last 12 to four, 24 months, you know. There are uh, bioinformatics and, uh, and uh, computer science guys that are are cranking the data and finding better ways to combine the genealogies and the DNA. I know family search people have, uh, you know, in their Lehigh building, you know, you probably drive uh, by that building several times, you know, your depth is a building, family search building in Lehigh, which looks like a little bit of a Google 
type of, uh, of building, you know, like very high tech. And they have a whole department in there that are looking at this DNA thing for family history, for the church, you know, for, for Latter-day Saints uh, in, a, in a very serious matter. You know, the last uh, uh, Roots Tech conference, I don't know how many of you have been able to go to Roots Tech in Salt Lake City, had over 27, le- I think 27 lectures on DNA and family history, you know. Uh, and they were not all the same topic. You know, so there is a lot, a lot coming out. Great, thank you. A lot of related questions here. So we have a question, are there different types of DNA tests? So for example, if, if, if you did do an Ancestry.com test, um, like I did, I don't have the Y chromosome uh, data, I believe. T- could you tell us just a little bit more about this? And do you recommend submitting tests to multiple companies? Are there d- different advantages to different way th- people do things? So the budget is always an issue. So it all depends on how much somebody is willing to spend for these type of things. So mm-hmm. I, the, the low hanging fruit or good starting point is with ancestry. I will start with ancestry. Uh, I, I don't work for them. I don't make any money out of what they, you know, their product. So I can, you know, I, I just say they, they are the best out there right now. And uh, they have the largest database usually it, the prices are about all the same with the other company, but the tools and the, and the amount of people tested with them, uh, there is no match. But if I would have extra money, then I would go to Family 3 DNA, which is this other company, FTDNA, Family3DNA.com. And uh, they are the only ones selling the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA testing. And uh, I believe there is a Belknap Y chromosome surname project. Uh, uh, our family three DNA. I don't have more details about it, and I know there was some issues related to privacy, but uh, that would be the only place you can get Y chromosome mitochondrial DNA testing. And they run specials all the time. They run, you know, a Y chromosome special on Father's Day and a mitochondrial DNA special on Mother's Day, and then Christmas and Black Friday. So. Uh, always look what their standard price is, and if you're not in a hurry, wait a couple of months, you might be able to get uh, a special deal on that. So those will be the three places. If you are interested in health uh, information, in addition to the genealogical information, since we also get, you know, our bad genes and our good genes from uh, our ancestors, uh, 23andMe is a company that provides uh, a combination of genealogy and uh, uh, health information. You can then download data, uh, your DNA from this company, from Ancestry or from uh, uh, 23andMe, and you can upload it for free in Family 3 DNA and in MyHeritage without paying. So you would have your, your same DNA in more places and be more visible and looking at more, more company. MyHeritage, for example, has more European individual tested. Um, Ancestry does not sell their kids to Italy. Here in Italy, cannot buy that. The only way I can have Ancestry is that when I'm in the United States, I buy one of the kids and I have a shipper there and then send it back. But if I would order one in Rome, they will not send it to me. Um, so that my heritage is a lot of Europeans. And you know that as an American, as a, as a citizen of the United States, your ancestors most likely come from many different places around the world, including Europe. So that would be a place to make this connection you know through through my heritage and you can up, download your data at ancestry and upload it for free at my heritage if that sounds too difficult for you just contact me we'll, uh, we'll uh, find a way to, to make it happen thank you thank you very much do we have any other qu- last minute questions here where I, I saw a question popping up about israelites dna and yeah. a good place to go and read it something i I'm the author of the gospel essay, uh, the gospel topic essay on DNA and Book of Mormon. So go to LD, just Google it, Book of Mormon and DNA studies on LDS.org. And uh, that should be a good place to start um, addressing that, that issue. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that. Yes. Well, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a pleasure. Uh, been a pleasure, Ugo. Um, and we hope that you'll uh, not get too sunburned there. And, uh, and uh, uh, stay safe and enjoy the, enjoy the seafood. Um, 
thank you, thank you, thank you so much for for uh, for all you've done here and and are doing, and we and we appreciate your open offer for uh, uh, entertaining questions and and uh, be careful what you offer, right? Let's see. Uh, all right. <laughs> I can always in your emails. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. All, All right. right. Thank you, Kerr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your virtual union. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to share my screen uh, and give come back to our and in, we would invite you. Uh, we would invite you to submit your information. While we're on here, uh, we're seeing that, um, unfortunately, we have lost uh, uh, every year, every 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 year, every we have an ongoing exodus of of uh, members of the family who graduate from mortality, and and uh, we our hearts go out to those who are mourning uh, family members who have who have moved on. Uh, we encourage you to not delay in submitting your information, um, in collecting uh, and sharing photographs and, and, and other, other information. Uh, this is very important, very, very, very important. Um, and it's just so easy to put it off and then once, once your story, and, and, to, and to write your own story and, to, and save that for others. Um, <clears throat> Let me also, at this point, uh, thank Ashley for the tremendous contribution. Uh, and you'll be able to, sh to access the videos, uh, this, this video and the previous part one uh, video on the, uh, on the, on the website. Um, I encourage you, to, encourage you to stay in touch to, um, especially to, to uh, 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 pass on these, this information. We're so grateful to have all of you here with us today. And, and uh, encourage you to pass on information to your to your family members and encourage them uh, encourage them. Thank you to Don also for another great flyer and uh, and thank you family reps. We uh, please encourage your family rep. We are um, and again please like us on Facebook and connect on Instagram and make a financial contribution to help keep the the organization uh, going uh, strong. You're in a position to do so. We hope to see you in person in two years at our next reunion, hopefully in a post-coronavirus world. And the, clo the closing prayer, the closing prayer will now be given by Lori uh, Belknap Pearson, who is my sister. Our dear Father in heaven, we come before thee at the close of this family reunion in deep gratitude for the structure that thou has established of families and the, the bonding that we have by sharing that family history and the DNA that, that we all carry as descendants of Gilbert Belknap. We are so grateful for the information that we've received today that we've been able to learn more about our history and our ancestors, as well as the, the miracle of DNA and, and how far it has come in terms of us understanding how it is past and, and what it means to us in our lives and to our research. We are so grateful, Father, for all of the people who have spent so much time and energy in making this possible today. Please bless them for their efforts and those that serve us in this Belknap family organization. Help us each to spread the word and to reach out to one another and to feel those bonds of family that connect us throughout eternity. We say these things humbly, Father, in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lori. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you. It's uh, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs>
Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.